Uh, and Shomna, just so that you know, the audience here is predominantly, if not entirely, the data science uh, community in Flipkart. And uh, as you can probably guess, that many of them also work on discovery-related problems, personalization, recommendation, and so on. But there are folks from other other areas as well. But uh, it's it's a it's a uh, broad data science uh, community. Uh, in case you want to customize your talk in any manner, and so on. And so on. So it's a pleasure, Shomna. Thank you for making the time. I know it's evening. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks for the kind introduction. I see some of my old colleagues and uh, friends are here. I cannot see everyone in Google Mates, but it's a pleasure to be here. To me, I should have mentioned I'm the engineering lead of the shopping discovery team at Pinterest. And the mission of our team is to help users to discover inspiring products and brands that will help them to create a life they love. And shopping recommendations plays a key role in that mission. But not only just for Pinterest mission, shopping recommendations plays a key role in overall e-commerce ecosystem. So I'll start with a quiz. I'll start with a quiz. Uh, currently, the global e-commerce uh, annual uh, retail sales is $4 trillion. Take a guess, like what fraction of that comes from the recommendations shown on the side? Feel free to use the chat box and the chat box we have in Google Made and put any number that you can guess. I'm assuming many of you like have the domain knowledge, so we'll come up with a correct guess. I'll just pause here for a second. Take this. I mean, it's fine. Any number. Rahul said 40 to 50 percent, one trillion. So that is close to 30 percent. 1.2. Yeah. Somebody said 60 to 70 percent, very optimistic. Nikhil, $4 trillion. So at the 50 percent range, he's very optimistic all the time. Yeah, so it is around, sorry, my slide has some problem. So it is, what happened? Okay. I'm on the next slide, yeah. So it is actually 30 percent. So it is more than $1 trillion of sales is coming from the recommendations sold on the side. And as many of you in this room will know that these recommendations are generated from fully automated machine learning system. So I find it fascinating to think that ML models or fully automated ML models are driving more than trillion dollar business in e-commerce. And in this talk, we'll go into the details of how those recommendations are generated. This talk is divided into three parts. Uh, first, we will have an introduction of how shopping at Pinterest looks like. And then we will do a deep dive into shop similar recommendation. And finally, we'll talk about how, when we have multiple different recommendations, how do we put them together using a technology that we call whole page optimization. So people come to Pinterest to collect ideas and inspirations. They collect like images, videos, and stories and organize them into boards. We call those videos, images, or stories as pins, and they collect them on the boards. So the use cases are various, like they start from cooking, travel, home decor, uh, fashion, attending party. There are many different use cases. Here are some boards from my own Pinterest account. You can see my use cases are kids, uh, uh, home decor, travel, a little bit of workout. You can also see cooking is not really my thing. And many of these use cases has underlying shopping intent. In fact, a study done by eMarketer last year showed that 47% of the users come to Pinterest to find or shop for products. This is three to five times higher compared to other social media like Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and others. So last few years, we have launched many shopping features. One of them is what we call this product detail page, probably you call it item page. And this is quite different from other pins displayed on Pinterest. So on the product detail page, we show all the usual product information, like product title, price, brand reviews. We also show different shopping recommendations, like Shop Similar and many others, which is the subject of talk today. 
And on Pinterest, we have all the major US merchants in the category of home decor and fashion, like Wayfair, Home Depot, Urban Outfitters, and others. But Pinterest is not a regular e-commerce site. When we think about shopping on Pinterest, we think about a journey from inspiration to purchase. User comes, users come to Pinterest with a very broad idea in mind, like setting up living room. Then they collect inspiration and ideas on like how the living room looks like. And then they learn their own preference, like what furniture do they like? What kind of styles, what kind of scholars do they like? Then they refine their choices, like from which brand or which price point they should buy that product. And finally, they make the purchase. So it's a much longer journey. Let's take a more concrete example. Here is our user Jenny from Brooklyn. She's looking to furnish a new apartment. So after collecting inspiration and images about living room, she decides that she needs a lamp for a living room. At that point, there are many different entry points to go into the shopping mode on Pinterest. One of the major one is what we call close up shop. So when a user close up, close up on a pin or like taps on a pin to take a closer look, they see this image and they see the objects on the image are tagged with the name. And once they tap on any of those uh, objects, they find like the shopping recommendation, which are very similar to the objects shown on the image. So apart from this close up, another major shopping entry point is search. As Jenny comes to the search, she finds already some shopping ideas curated for her based on her recent activity. And as she goes ahead and types the table lamp as the search query, she finds a shop button. We call it shop tab. And inside the shop tab, there are only these products are displayed. And along with the products, all the product information, like price, the title, and the brands are shown. On the search, we also show some shopping recommendations, like shop by brands, et cetera. Apart from these shopping features, we also have advanced shopping features like virtual try on where a user can try on a list tape and see how they look on that list tape. We also have skin tone filter where a user can select a skin tone of their choice and see the people on that skin of that skin tone how they look like on that product. So all these shopping features are great. We really love it but the true testament is the usage of these features. Pinterest has 442 monthly active users across the world. And this year in 2020, we saw 85% increase in usage of the shopping features, particularly people who come into the shopping services. Shopping is currently live in US and UK. And here are a couple of charts showing the growth in 2020 in shopping users and shopping advertisers. So hope this gives you a good introduction of how shopping at Pinterest works. At this point, I'm a bit curious, like how many of you use Pinterest? So use the chat box and give me a plus one if you have used Pinterest in last one month for any use case. Aditya used it, okay. So we have at least one user. We have a couple of users. Oh, we have many, that's, that's great. Yeah, so Pinterest actually, Pinterest is live in India. So, and we actually have a large user base in India. As per Comscore, there are more than 15 million unique visitors of, of, from India. Let me just read the, there's a comment. Yeah, yes. After this talk, I might find living room ideas on Pinterest. Yeah, you should use for that. Okay, with that, we'll switch gear and we'll, Going to the main topic of the talk is the recommender system. So maybe just for my understanding, give me a plus one if you know how recommender system actually works, the internals of recommender system, if you're familiar in some form or the other. Okay. Yeah, we, we have many folks who understand how recommendation system works. Hopefully you will also get to learn something new from this talk. Uh, recommender systems has a very rich history. It has like a 20 years of literature and there is phenomenal progress on algorithm that works behind the recommendation system. To name few of them like collaborative filtering, matrix factorization, 
And also these days, the deep, new, uh, the deep neural networks are heavily used. There is also literature on neural collaborative filtering. But in spite of this, all this progress, recommender systems still are open and challenging problem. Today's recommender system has to work at a very large scale. Often it has to provide recommendations for hundreds of millions of users from hundreds of millions of items. In some sense, the scale of the problem has outgrown the scale of or the progress in the technology. Another challenge is today's recommender system has to work with different data types, user profile, text, image, video, and also graph. Back in the early days, recommender system just used to work out of the utility metrics, the user item utility metrics. Another problem is current recommender system has to deal with multiple different objectives, like different types of engagement, like clicks, add to cart, checkout, in your case. And we have to balance those engagements with the relevance and diversity type of objective. Also, in e-commerce sites, there are multiple different recommenders, not just one recommenders. And then when we have multiple recommenders, the challenge is how to put everything together to create the whole page for the user. In this talk, we'll go into the details of shop similar recommendation, which will cover the first three challenges. We'll also talk about whole page optimization. We'll not go into the details of how to create different types of recommendation. So shop similar recommendation. Here are the inputs and outputs of the shop similar recommendation. At the input layer, it has the query product and the user as the input. And it generates like the top K recommendation that is displayed to the user on the app. If we zoom in one level down, you will see there are two major blocks in the shop similar recommendation. One is candidate generator, which generates few hundred or maybe a thousand candidates from a huge catalog of size 100 plus million. And then there's a ranker, which applied more sophisticated and heavyweight algorithm to score and rank each of these candidates and then the top K candidates are displayed to the user. So the rankers are hey, the rankers. So much, one quick clarification question, sorry. Uh, yeah. the, the query product that you showed, is that also from your catalog, or it could be uh, uh, like a camera captured image uh, by, by the user? Yeah, it, it could be both. But I think the recommendation algorithm depends on you might have to build different types of recommendation. In, in this talk, we'll cover the query product. But it could be a query pin. It could be a scene pin. But then you don't have the product feature as the input. You have the image as an input. But let's say you do not have the brand. You right. do not have the product attributes as the input. So the input will change. OK. So in this case, you are assuming it's a product from your yeah. uh, look. Okay. Correct. Because in this case, the recommendation is shown on the PDP, the product detail page. So the input is the query product. Thank you. OK, so the ranker is often a machine learned model and uh, trained on the historical engagement data. For the candidate generator in a recommendation system in practice actually has multiple different candidate generators. Like it has candidate generator based on the text similarity. It has candidate generator like called meme boost or basically the memorized engagement, uh, the candidates that were engaged in the past. But with the progress in deep learning, what really working well is the embedding best candidate generator. And let's see how that works. So at the very core of embedding best candidate generator, there is a deep neural network which takes a product as an input and creates embeddings for that product. So there is an offline workflow which goes over the catalog and creates product embedding for each and every product in the catalog. Those embeddings are then stored in the embedding store. At runtime, when we receive the query product, we use the same deep neural network to generate the query embedding. Now we use the query embedding to do an approximate nearest neighbor lookup on the embedding store to generate the candidates. So at the heart of it is that deep neural network is generating the embedding. So the key one of the key questions here is how do we create this product embedding? So, uh, uh, sorry. Uh... And just one question. So are you going to deep dive on the that uh, approximate nearest neighbor, uh, uh, like over the talk, or you're just, you no. just focusing on yeah. the training? 
we will just focus on the embedding because that's something new we do for the nearest neighbor retrieval we use the hnsw it's a standard package available uh, we customize it a bit but i think the major work is our work is on the generating the embedding okay okay sure then i'll uh, like i'll i would like to ask a few questions but maybe towards the end of the uh, presentation sure sure makes sense Thank okay you. Yeah, so I think one of the key question here is how do we create this product embedding? And I'll just pause here for a minute and for a second and let you think like, how can we create the product embedding? So you might be thinking like, this is a very open-ended question. There is various ways we can create product embedding. Let's try. We can do as simple as, let's say, just use the word to wait and create product embedding from the product title. Or you can you create product embedding from the product image using any standard network like VGG or ResNet. But at Pinterest, we create a product embedding in a very special way. We would like to leverage the giant pinboard graph that we have at Pinterest. And more about pinboard graph in a second. We also want to use the different data types that we have, the different data that we have to create the embedding, like the image, the text, the product attributes, et cetera. We want to leverage the massive amount of engagement data we have on the platform. And then finally, we want to ensure that this embedding generator scales for billions of pins and hundreds of millions of products. So here is the pin board graph. The pins, as I mentioned at the beginning, the user collects the images and the videos, we call them pin on their board. So two pins on the same board are generally similar to each other. Here are a couple of examples, like two boards are shown, kiteboarding and snowboarding. And you can see the two pins on the same boards are similar. So on the pin board graph, the two pins are connected if they're in the same board. And by virtue, they're similar. Now, once we have the pin board graph, we use an algorithm called graph convolutional neural network. Internally, we call graph sage to create the embedding for each node or pin of that graph. This is a very seminal work came out of Pinterest. I've linked the paper in the slide. And this technique has, is used across many different teams in Pinterest. And we know that this is also used across different other companies as well. And at the core of this, there is this very simple convolve operation, which creates the embedding of each node. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh... So, yeah. really sorry. so this uh, input graph that is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how do you form the edge? Uh, like, is it like, uh, like inside the uh, inside a board, all the pins will get connected to each other, or uh, uh, like something else? Yeah, that that's that's right. We make it a keep it as a bipartite graph, pin to board. That's why we call pin board graph. But effectively, if you just think about the pin on which the algorithm runs, two pins are connected if they are in the same board. Okay. Of course. So once we have the graph, uh, we applied, I mean, this graph convolution neural network uh, algorithm, but at the heart of it, there is this very simple convolve operation, which works in an iterative way and creates the embedding of each and every node. So at each step, uh, at each step of the iteration to create the embedding of a node, uh, this uh, it takes the average embeddings of the neighboring nodes and then concatenates with the embedding of the node. So one more time, but at each iteration step, the embedding of a node is created by concatenating its own embedding and the average embedding of the neighboring node. So you can see there is a recursive definition here. The embedding of a node is created from its neighbor's embeddings of the neighboring node. And this is where the graph is used. And this is where the information from other nodes flows into a node. And that's where the power of this algorithm comes in, in play. So in this picture, you, will, you are seeing the nodes. You are seeing some rectangular boxes. Those are actually the embeddings of the node. There are some square boxes as well. Those are fully connected neural network. Those are used to transform the embeddings. And those are the parameters of the algorithm that we need to learn. And these parameters are learned using the historical engagement data we have. So we use the historical engagement data. We take the query product and all the recommended product if the recommended products are engaged, then that is a positive example. If it is not engaged, it's a negative example. And then we apply the triplet loss 
to learn the parameters of, of this network, which are this, this fully connected neural network. And how do we use the different data types? Uh, when we create the initial embeddings of the each of the node, we we use we concatenate the text embedding and the image embedding to create the initial embeddings of the node. And that's how we are able to use the multiple different data types to create the embedding. There are many other smart tricks applied on the paper, and that really works as uh, works well for us. Few of them are like that. Once one of them is like instead of using the neighbors in the graph, the algorithm actually uses random walk to sample neighbors. And using the random walks, we get neighbors actually from far away part of the graph. And that's how, that's how the information from the far away part of the graph flows in much faster. Also, while taking the, uh, the negative examples, we use the distance weighted negative sampling, and that gives us some gain. There are many other such innovations listed in the paper, and I would highly recommend that you read that paper. So now this graph size algorithm is used on the pin board graph across all pins, products and non-products pin. These days, we are working on tuning this algorithm for shopping use cases. Few things we are trying and working well. One is like this fine tuning on the product engagement. First, we train this graph size algorithm in all, all pins all pin engagement, and then we fine tune it only on the product engagement. Another thing also working is using product feature. While creating those initial embedding, apart from using the image embedding, the text embedding, we also use the embedding of the product title, other product attributes. One more thing we are thinking of trying out is using a product specific graph, not just the pin board graph, maybe like a co-purchase graph. So that's all about embedding. So I think the graph size embedding is really good. It creates a very high quality embedding for us. And that helps us to get a very high quality candidate set for the recommendation. Hi, uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is sure, sure. a couple of questions. So on GCN, if uh, if I were to compare other embeddings, right? Uh, uh, for example, I use the pin board and then maybe I can do a word, word to a kind of uh, approach on that, right? I can use all the pins as context of a pin. Uh, either that approach, or even if I have a graph and I do a random walk like you guys did, right? But I, again, I on the random walk, I again use a word to work. How do these embeddings compare with the uh, G scenes? Yeah, I didn't fully follow the random walk best embedding the other way of creating embedding. But in the paper, you will see there are several comparisons. There are comparisons against if you just create the embedding of each node independently without using the graph, let's say image embedding, let's say what to make embedding of the nodes. It, it builds them hands down. Also, you can generate the recommender other way, like this, just random walk based recommendation. Instead of going to the uh, embedding, you can create the candidate for a given product, just this random walk based neighbor. It builds that hand up, hands down. So, but we probably have it compared with using the graph in other ways. But this scales very well. I think the scalability is one aspect of billions of pin. This one scales really Got well. It. Yeah, I was aware of the Pixie one that you were talking about. And the second approach that yeah. I mentioned was not to work, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, the paper is a good reference for me to go and look at the comparisons. Yeah, I, I think I'm familiar with not to, not to work. We didn't, we didn't compare against that there. So I don't know. Uh, but Pixie, it, it beats Pixie hands down. Got it. Uh, Shumrat, I have one question. So this is on the uh, uh, negative sampling, right? So you you said that you uh, basically, uh, uh, I mean, the training uses a triplet loss. So uh, so I'm a bit uh, uh, confused about the positive and the negative uh, data point that you get, right? So uh, does it come from the, uh, I mean, uh, the similar, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, the, so I'm I'm assuming that for there would be a query product and for that you show multiple. Uh, a similar recommendation and mm -hmm. all that if if a user clicks on a product that would be a positive pair and rest of the uh, product from the same uh, portal uh, you will consider as a negative pair uh, 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 is that what you do or something different that's exactly what we do but then you have many many negative so you cannot use all the negatives to train okay. it will be overwhelmed so you have to down sample the negative okay and that's where this sampling comes in i see i see okay okay sure sure Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so so GraphSearch gives us very high quality candidates. And once we have the candidate set, the next problem is use that ranker to score and rank order them. So as I mentioned, ranker is like a ranker is a machine learning model. It predicts the probability of engagement given the query product and the user. And as I mentioned, the problem is these days there are many different types of engagement. On Pinterest, we have save, close up, clicks, long clicks, conversion. So how do we model all these different types of engagement? For that, we use a multi-head DNN model. The way it works is at the input layer, we put all different kinds of features, this graph stage embedding, user embedding, token embedding, all different types of features. Then we have a technology called AutoML, which groups those features and crosses the features between different groups. Then those crossed features uh, flows through a fully connected network and then we have multiple different heights, one height for each of the engagement. Those predicts the score for those engagements. And those scores are calibrated to true probability. Then calibrated scores are combined using an utility function to predict the final score. Then the products are ranked based on this final score. So this, this multi-head neural network, I think this is fairly standard. And many of you might be familiar with how, how this thing works. But to make this thing in practice, we need to take care of a few things. One is calibration. So calibration is making the output probability true probability. What that means is, let's say you test your text examples, test examples, and you take all the examples where the output is 0.8. So the expectation should be, the true probability should be 80% of them are actually true positive and 20% are negative. So your output score should match to the true positive rate. And why we need that? We need that because if once the, all the engagements are true probability, we can compare against each other and then we can blend them, we can combine them. That's why you need that. You might be thinking that each head, if we are using sigmoid loss or cross entropy loss, they are expected to output the probability. So why we need to calibrate them? There are several reasons, even if we are using sigmoid loss, the outputs are not well calibrated probabilities. One major reason is this downsampling the negatives. As I just mentioned, that there are often in, in a problem in practice, you, also, you guys also must be seeing that, you have few positives and many more negatives. And one way to deal that is downsampling the negative. And once you downsample the negatives, the classifier gets biased and it tends to predict more false positive. And that's why it loses the calibration. I have linked a paper on the slides that showed there are other reasons where the classifier loses the calibrations, like the complex DNN model or batch normalization goes against calibration. And this paper shows interestingly that from LeanEd, which came out in 1998 to ResNet, the accuracy of the classifier has increased, but the calibration has decreased. That's been the gap between the accuracy and the average confidence has actually increased. So in our problem, we handle the lack of calibration due to downsampling. And there is actually a very simple way to handle that. If your output score is Y hat, and if your negative downsampling rate is alpha, you can just use this formula to correct or calibrate the classifier. And on the right-hand side, the plot is showing the plot of output score versus the true positive load. So you can see it's a kind of line and the classifier is here the reasonably calibrated for each different engagement. So once you have the calibrated score, we use this utility function to combine them and to predict the final score. The beauty of using this utility function is you can encode any business logic. Let's say you want to give higher priority to check out over click. This utility function gives you a very simple framework to give higher weight to check out over click. Another advantage is this utility function separates the business logic from model training. For some reason, let's say your business priority changes, you want to drive more profit over revenue, you can just change the utility of the corresponding engagement. You don't have to retrain your model with a new objective. So that's the advantage of using the utility function. So, so one more question. Uh, it seems as of now, these utility weights are uh, uh, basically uh, configured using heuristics or uh, 
do you tune them also towards a particular objective very good London. question so that's the question in my next slide is how do you get this how do you tune this utility well you can use heuristics you can hand tune based on business logic or you can go more principal to go more principal this becomes another optimization function so your utility weight utility weights are variable x and you want to find the argmax argmax x given the function fx right so but in this case the problem is the fx is a black box function the reason it is a black box function i think it is not generally doesn't have an analytical expression or derivative but another major problem is this is very expensive to evaluate the fx as you were mentioning that to know like the true true output of fx or the true matrix from fx you probably need to deploy this utility in production and run an ab test that's very costly if you want to evaluate for many different x and this is a standard problem of hyperparameter tuning the way you can do it you can use grid search or random search like you randomly search on many different point or you can just do a grid search on many different points but the problem with those approaches is they do a search each search independently without leveraging the prior knowledge from the previous searches and that's where the bayesian optimization is much more effective in tuning hyperparameter or this kind of uh, or tuning a black box function there's a quite a bit of details in bayesian optimization i'll just cover it at a high level at a high level there are two key components in bayesian optimization one is the surrogate model as i mentioned fx is very costly to evaluate so bayesian optimization yeah so i have a doubt actually so how did you map it to an optimization problem so the part that i understood is that uh, there is a function which is a combi weighted combination of the probability three right? but what is the target here what are you uh, optimizing are you because you you want to set the weights right we want to set the weight optimizing for a metric let's say in this case our overall revenue overall revenue uh, okay and uh, for what and, like and the overall revenue from the production system like actual revenue after we deploy the model not in our test data okay is that make sense yeah yeah kind of yeah so that's why it becomes very expensive to evaluate you can always evaluate in a test data but that's not a true true uh, true value of the function the true value is once you deploy you need to know you can know that people are actually buying or not and then you see it's maximizing the gmv or not so we want to learn the weight maximizing the true objective got it okay uh hey somnath i had a follow up question uh, to what you were describing as as lucky and you were talking you were talking about optimizing for the revenue in production after the model is deployed right so does that mean you're basically incorporating any real time feedback um, into the model or um uh, in general can you elaborate a bit more on how you are optimizing for the uh, revenue in production yeah so i think little bit confusing here so i think you train your model in your training data but when you have the utility weights those are not that many parameter your model like that neural network has millions of parameter or whatever you cannot really optimize on a production but your utility weight or your hyper parameters are few so the way you do is you choose for for case of let's say grid search you just say okay this 10 different parameter i will just experiment and see which one is best i'll pick it right that's a simple one so here the thing is the number of variables is much lesser but the function is much costly to evaluate for your training your number of parameters are huge but it's much easier to evaluate so that's why it's a hyper parameter tuning versus regular training yeah but but you're still optimizing on Uh, yeah 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 but you're still optimizing on the historical um, revenue data right no the utility tuning needs to be done on the actual i mean the best way to do it is on the actual production you deploy it and you see how it is driving and then you pick your utility i see okay, okay. so like basically like and how often would you do it yeah so that's where the question comes right how often you do it you can do it like 100 of time but it will be very very costly it might take months so that's why we are going into bayesian optimization that we can do it few evaluation and still get an optimal function so uh, one more uh, so uh, when you are tuning this there are underlying multitask model right parameters as well uh, which are also uh, getting trained which needs to be retrained again right 
say no, for that's, a... that's why the utility decouples the training and the utility. Training, we don't need to retrain. We just want to figure out, given the current training, given the current calibrated output, what is the best utility? Okay, say so you get this in, say, next five day, 10 day. Then yeah. again, you, uh, and how often do you need to update your multitask model? You generally don't need to update your multitask model until you retrain your underlying model until your business objective change. So if you are training your model a month or whatever, you just find the best utility weight and live with that. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jyotir Moy. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so how do you ensure that the um, utility uh, thing is not overshadowing the probabilities? What is overshadowing means? I mean, in the sense that uh, not uh, redundant, making the probabilities re redundant. I mean, in the sense like you could have any sort of utility weight, which would basically overpower uh, the probabilities. Uh, I mean, do you have any sort of constraints uh, on finding? There are constraints. The thing actually we use is little more, uh, little more complicated, but I don't see it can overpower. All we are saying, find the best weight given this set of probability output that will drive our business objective. So whatever this probability output, they are there. Now find the weights that will combine them in the best way to drive our business objective. Mm -hmm. I had one more question regarding uh, the, you, uh, the, sam uh, the random walk slide. Uh, so I was wondering why you do, why you do a random walk bec uh, because that does not change the adjacency matrix, right? Um, I mean, the size of the adjacency matrix. That, that does not change, but that then you will get neighbors from the far away part of the graph and the information from the far away part of the graph will flow in much smoothly or much faster. Okay, and if you don't do a random walk, then probably you get uh, far, I mean... Uh, it becomes uh, slower, the learning becomes slower, you have to run more iterations, it will much more costly. Okay, and what is the balance between how much you do random walk and uh, how much, uh, I mean, where do you stop? Uh, I think there is uh, the paper doesn't give those details internally. We do like 50 steps of random walks and get the neighbors, and then we we just add. that that becomes the neighbors of the graph. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let's one sort of final question. Final yeah. question on this. Um, while optimizing for one aspect, uh, there is a possibility that we harm other aspects of business. Uh, maybe GMV increases, but something else now decreases. How do you do you ensure that? Is there a way to ensure? Yeah. So that's why you need to deploy in production, right? You deploy in production, you know, like when I say that like your business objective is increasing GMV, underlying there are constraints like that you don't hurt the other metrics. So until you deploy in production, you really don't show the balance. So you get your A/B test reading and say, okay, this is our best utility way, right? Okay. So. Okay, so then, then the problem becomes, how do you run only few experiments and then still pick the one that is best? You don't do an exhaustive search over all these utility weights, which is like a real value parameters. Okay, okay thank, you. thank you. Yeah, so that's why the Bayesian optimization, maybe it's a little confusing, but I'll still cover it in a high level. I think it still makes sense to just understand how it works. So it first creates a sur surrogate function. As I mentioned, the true evaluation of the function can only happen in production, seeing all the metrics and seeing, okay, this is doing the right thing that we want as a business. We want to drive GMB, don't want to hurt relevance, clicks, add to clicks, add to card, any other metric. So to get that reading, you need to evaluate in production, but that's very costly. So Bayesian optimization uses a surrogate function and the surrogate function is much easier to evaluate. And the surrogate functions are typically a Gaussian process, uh, which makes this func surrogate function a normal distribution, which is much easier to evaluate. And it's basically the past values of that function. So apart from the surrogate function, there is one more thing called acquisition function, which predicts the next point to evaluate. And that's what the beauty is. The next point to evaluate is this acquisition function balances between the exploration and exploitation. Here the exploration is, it picks a point where there's a high uncertainty of the function. Your FX has a very high uncertainty. So it wants to learn what is the true value of this function. So it wants to evaluate that point versus it exploits like where it knows the value is already high. It is giving high GMB with all the constant meeting. So it can explore, sorry, exploit that point. So it balances an explorer and exploitation. And here is one visualization of that. So acquisition function is predicting the next point to evaluate in this, in this uh, picture 
is where the function is a very high uncertainty and it will learn that okay there the function is not optimal so that's why it, it helps us in picking the optimal value in much fewer evaluation compared to let's say grid search or random search so that's all about Bayesian optimization and candidate generation ranker. You might be thinking like how all these are working. These are really working good for us or not. Here are some, some numbers. So when we started using our, our graph search candidate retrieval, we saw 10% improvement in engagement. When we switched our ranker from the GVDT to a GNN model, we saw 5% improvement in engagement. And when we switch from the DNN, that single head DNN to multi head DNN with this all, all this calibration and all, we saw 7% improvement in GMB. So that, that's all about shop similar. And then we will move to my last part of my talk, which is the whole page optimization. And if you are lost in this calibration and Bayesian optimization, it's a good time for you to start following again because that's not the prerequisite for this part of the talk. Uh, Shumrat, uh, sorry to disturb again. So uh, I was just wondering if you can give us like some idea about the uh, that approximate neighbor, nearest neighbor that you talked about, uh, like uh, what sort of challenges that you faced uh, uh, on that and like uh, some pointers uh, that you feel are important. And uh, so basically the practical aspect of it, right? Like the challenges you faced, how did you overcome? Uh, if you can uh, highlight them, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I think the paper has very good data. It has one section why we are using this random walk best neighbor. You can just pre-calculate those neighbors. So see, the graphs we are pre-constructing. We can construct the graph based on the two pins in the same board, or we can do a random walk and get the neighbor. So it is it is equally costly. It is not, not any additional cost. And paper also shows like how much gain we are getting using this approximate nearest neighbor. So I would say that's a good reference. It has good bit of details to learn. Okay. Okay. And you just uh, you just implemented that paper as it is, or you had to customize it uh, for your use case. I mean, there are more details on it. Even maybe I'm not aware of all the details, uh, but I think the paper is a good good reference. That's pretty much it. Maybe the customization is how many steps we do, some more weights and all. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. but fundamentally, it is still still the same. I, I believe the actual implementation. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's move on. Yeah. Hey, uh, so one Sorry. last question on the revenue kind of metric. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, generally, these kind of metrics, you see them as a long-term metric or short-term kind of metrics, right? And even when you have a short-term metric, like say weekly revenue or say weekly GMV and all, they kind of have an impact on overall uh, uh, revenue and all, right? Uh, and long-term metric as well. So when you do this kind of short-term optimization, have you faced some issues like uh, they are not matching with your long-term uh, objectives or uh, metrics, business metrics? That's that's always the I mean that's that's a big problem for everyone. Uh, like the short, balancing the short-term metrics and long, the lifetime value or long-term value, what they call. That's an entirely separate problem of how do you optimize the utility. You run an A/B test, whatever metric you care, you can optimize using Bayesian optimization your utility. If you run your A-B test for two months, it's a long-term metric, you can optimize for that. But typically, like we and probably everyone runs A-B test for weeks and days and optimize for short-term metrics. And it's still a very open question. How do you how do you balance your long-term metric with the short-term one? Okay. Okay. So let me just uh, go quickly go over the, uh, the whole page optimization. Any e-commerce sites has like multiple different recommenders. I just took the screenshot of the uh, Flipkart app, and I can see there are 10 different modules are displayed on the on Flipkart app. Uh, on the desktop version of your web page, there are slightly different number of some modules, but there are still many more, many different modules on Flipkart. Same on uh, Pinterest. On our item detail page or the product detail page, you will see multiple different recommenders. Like we talked about shop similar, there are other like more from this brand, similar item under certain price based on the browsing history, et cetera. And not only that, each, recommend, each of this recommender module, you can display using different titles. Like instead of calling it shop similar, you can call it more to shop, you can call it similar products. So there are different titles to select. And the item displayed on each of these recommenders, for each item, there could be multiple different images to select. And finally, you can have maybe different page layout or page template with different style element and all to render the page. 
So the question becomes, how do you put all these things together, the recommenders, the title for each recommenders, the image for each item, and the page layout to optimize for another, like the, the holistically optimize for a user metric or a business metric. So that's where the whole page optimization plays a role. More concretely, the problem here is module triggering, which module to display, module ranking, how to rank out of them, which title to select for a given module, which item image to display for an item, and which UI template to select. The challenge here is you want to model the interaction between modules. So when in this page, one module has huge impact on the other module. The presence of a module actually controls like how the engagement on the other modules as well. So unlike Ranker, you cannot score each of these elements independently and then put them together. You need to model the interaction. So that's where the whole page optimization comes in. And how do we do it? We use this multi-arm bandit framework. And what multi-arm bandit framework allows us is to allow exploration and collect data in a principled way by minimizing regret. Why we need to do exploration? We need to do exploration when the data is sparse. You don't have training example for each of your output possibilities. Or your the user behavior is shifting. In our case, we often have combinatorial possibilities. If you think of that one rank order of a module is one possibility, then you basically have factorial n, n is the number of module, factorial n different rank orders of the modules. And if each of them is a possibility, you don't have training data for each of them to learn and score those each possibilities. Another thing is we want to often try out new modules, new UI templates. So for those new elements, there's no training data to score. Mitigate is bias is another reason to explore. And then shifting user population. The users for Pinterest is growing. We have new users from new demographic. We are going into new countries. So those are different types of population than what we have observed. So all these reasons we need to explore and collect data. And how multi arm bandit framework works, to, to apply multi arm bandit framework, you need to design arms and action or actions. And what the framework does is, at any given point of time, the framework balances between exploration and exploitation. Exploration here is trying out an arm to collect more data for that arm. And exploitation is picking an arm where we know the reward is higher. So it balances between this exploring an arm versus getting more reward for, from the arms. So the key problem here is, how do you design those arms? One very simple way you can design the arms is saying that each page layout is one arm. And anything changes on the page, it becomes a new arm. For example, if you change the title from soft similar to soft product, similar product, it's a new arm because it's a new page, it's a new arm. Or once you change the rank order of the modules, it's another arm. So you can design the arm, each instance of the page is one arm. So the advantage of that is very simple. Like you can just define the arm one one instance of the page. You can incorporate any kinds of elements like title change, module ranking change, but then it's impractical. You will have so many different arms, like combinatorial possibilities, millions of arms. You cannot really explore all the arms and collect data. So we need to do something smarter. That's where the slate bandit comes into play. The slate bandit has multi each as on a slate bandit, a slate has multiple slots. And each slot of the slate has different actions. Some examples are like, like a slot could be a position to place a module. And the actions for that slot would be different modules to display. Or a slot could be a module, and actions for the slot is the different titles that can, we can show for that module. Or a slot could be an item, and the actions are different item images that we can display for that item. So we have different slots and there are different actions for this slot. One thing to notice here, the number of slots are very few, and the number of actions per slot is also very few. So that's why we're kind of deconstructing the problem. And this paper, which came out of Netflix, which shows that we can do a slot level optimization. That means we can run the bandit for each slot on over that action space. So we do a, th so let's say to place a module on a slot, on a, on a position, we just do Thomson sampling over the modules and, and then pick the best module. Or to select a title for a module, you just do Thomson sampling over the titles and select the best title. 
So now if you're just optimizing for slots independently, the key question there is how we manage the interaction between the model. That's what we wanted to handle. The way it is handled is the reward is shared across all these elements. What that means is when we display this different module, if one module gets an engagement, somebody clicks on one module, other modules also get some reward. So since the rewards are shared, the interaction between the models are interaction between the modules are modeled to some extent. This doesn't work when you have a module or a slot that is negatively impacting the slate level reward. Let's say if you have a very bad module, if you place that, then this, this deconstruction doesn't work. But generally, we pick the module that's a good one, we pick the title that's a good one, so this is still applicable in our, in our area of problem. So where are we with this? We are still early in this one. We are running a lot of experiments, but we have seen some positive results so far. For example, this MAB-based module placement is performing a lot better than static placements. We have seen that MAB-based module triggering is actually giving us 5% more engagement than in some use cases. Also, we have seen in some use cases, this MAB-based item image selection gave us 10% more engagement. So that's all about uh, whole page optimization. And now I'll summarize my talk. So in summary, Pinterest provides a unique shopping experience from inspiration to purchase. We think this is probably the only place where the users comes with a very broad intent in mind, finds inspiration, and discover products that will help them to create a life they love. And shopping recommendation plays a key role in building that experience. And Pinterest shopping recommendation uses many state-of-the-art techniques like embedding-based candidate generator, multi-head DNN model, whole page optimization, et cetera. In conclusion, I will say the recommender system is a very impactful system. Remember that $1 trillion business that is driving an e-commerce? But it's still a very complex problem, and it is best studies in the industry setting because only the industries has the data and the users. So the way we can make recommended system is better, uh, better is by sharing knowledge. So I'm glad to get the opportunity to get to speak to you, and we'll look forward to learn from you. So with that, thank you all. Thank you for your time. Hope you got to learn something new. Thank you very much. Uh, very very interesting and I'm sure informative talk and. Uh, uh, from the from the number of questions and interactions that happened during the talk, uh, I'm sure you've got a sense that it was very good, engaging. Uh, so again, I mean, I'll let others to ask any questions, follow up questions that they have. We have about four five minutes. Uh, yeah, I don't have any questions, but I I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Song. It was a lovely talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ranjit.